Regardless, resident status abroad, living outside the shores of one's homeland can really be challenging and sometimes very difficult. Let's be sincere, to keep pace with artists from the host country abroad can really be difficult. Here on Dialogue in Diaspora, we give you every information, every news, every current issue you need to know on artists outside the UK. Dialogue in Diaspora is your link between the world and the United Kingdom. It's your window to Africa development. Here, live on Ben Television. Thank you for joining us on the program today. This is Voice coming to you uh, from Ben Television. This is where we discuss legal matters uh, here in the United Kingdom. We take a look at a series of um, um, legal issues and as they may affect you. And if you do require any support or assistance, uh, this is not specifically uh, a program that offers some kind of legal advice. You may speak to your solicitor, citizens advice, or better still, you speak with Jennifer Basiki, senior partner at Basiki Solicitors. My name is Tunde Labi. On the program again this wonderful, beautiful Saturday evening, we will be taking a look at um, immigration matter uh, dealing with the hostile environment. You will remember that a couple of years ago, um, the, the then Home Secretary, who is not a Prime Minister, uh, stated uh, making uh, Britain a, a hostile environment for uh, people who do not have the right to remain in the United Kingdom. And fast forward that to 2018, we had several issues that have led to uh, the Prime Minister being criticised of carrying over this hostile environment to evil people uh, who uh, should be regarded as uh, uh, British citizens, but for some reasons could not prove uh, the case I'm talking about the Windrush uh, generation. Today we're taking a look at dealing with uh, the hostile environment, how you may be affected. As usual, our uh, guest in the studio today is Jennifer Basiki, senior partner at All Basiki Solicitors here in London. Jennifer, good evening and thank you for being part of the program today. My pleasure, thank you. Um, it's not a story that the Prime Minister now then was the Home Secretary spoke about making Britain a hostile environment for people who do not have the rights to remain in the United Kingdom. Carrying that over, as we fast forward, how much do you think that policy has impacted on Britain and on our community? Well, we in the diaspora community, especially the Nigerian community, can tell you that it's impacted adversely. Um, when I say that, it, the idea was to make it's uncomfortable for undocumented people to live, work, mm -hmm. and continue to be active in society and to force them into a position where they regularize their status. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that legislation that was brought in, and some of it was brought in by Labour, we can't just blame Theresa May, but when David Cameron became Prime Minister, he set down the requirement for there to be stronger powers put in place for uh, the, the, the immigration officials to be able to remove unwanted, undocumented migrants. And the Abu Hamza case also really embarrassed Theresa May, who at the time was a Home Secretary. So seeing that people who have serious criminal convictions can um, still fight to stay in the UK kind of made uh, the, a level of public hostility towards migrants. So we have the adverse effect coming from the general public who have heard these negative rhetoric about immigration migrants. And then you had that leading towards the Brexit vote as well. Migrants are to blame for everything. They're to blame for no jobs. They're to blame for so many Eastern Europeans. They're to blame for everything. And then you have migrants themselves who fall into two categories. Not every migrant is an illegal migrant. And not every undocumented migrant is an illegal migrant. So because of the rhetoric that goes around, people who make you know, wrong assumptions and people who have genuinely been in the UK with legal rights to be here, as we saw from the Windrush scandal, were wrongly labelled as unlawful migrants. And this is because the Home Office, after pre being put under pressure, admitted to wrongfully destroying their documents. That doesn't just apply to the Windrush generation. We've recently had a confession from the Home Office that they've also may have wrongly um, 
outlined that students who had failed their English tests may have passed their English tests, and that could be up to 7,000 people. Mm -hmm. We also have the very many hundreds of thousands of people who are affected by the fees. People who were children, vulnerable, sick, are being asked to pay home office fees in the sum of 1,000 533 pounds in total. That is astronomical when it costs 450 pounds to process an application. Why are people being charged such astronomical amounts? And you see, none of that is put in front of the public. It's not, you know, somebody needs to do um, a, a subject access or an access request to the Home Office to say how much have migrants contributed towards the economy in application fees alone. We also have the problem of processing times. The longest processing time I personally have dealt with is over seven years and that was just a complex case but seven years there's no reason why somebody should have a delay of seven years after making an application. Legitimately you would expect that the application is dealt with within a reasonable time. Same with the appeals. Unfortunately, if you pay for an appeal, £140, the privilege of having your appeal listed, that's if you have a right of appeal, you can wait more than six months to have a hearing, sometimes more than a year. And that takes away from somebody's life. You can imagine, we've given this illustration before in, on this program, where you make an application and it takes more than a year to be considered. And then after that, if it's refused, you exercise the right of appeal. And then... If your appeal is not listed, you can imagine spending two years, three years, waiting for, simply for a decision. That really does, let me say, um, strip away one's confidence. It's terrible. It makes you regressed. So apart from the fact that the, the environment was hostile, it has bred a lot of um, hostility, not just between migrants, or oh, sorry, between the public and migrants, but it's also made a lot of migrants feel regressed. It, it's made them feel dejected. One of the other um, synergies that we've had, which is very negative also, is the fact that the children, the next generation, have felt disenfranchised. So you have children who have no recourse to public funds, mm. that have had issues getting into higher education. And so, when it comes down to things like going on school trips, obviously because they don't have the right paperwork, not being able to go. So you have an, a generation of children who have grown up with these adverse situations as well, not having a lot of money, having to be subject to immigration control, steep fees, no recourse to public funds, no access to higher education. And unfortunately, it's seen as one of the contributing factors to the level of street crime. Because if you have no ability to go into higher education and you are frustrated and you have a, a low in, you're from a vulnerable, low-income family, the issue of falling, falling into street crime, it, it becomes something that if you're in, the, in an area where you're susceptible for that to happen, it's more likely to happen. So we are finding that children are unfortunately being pushed into street crime. When you also think about trafficking, trafficking is something that um, uh, we have to, you have to look at the real definition of what it is. If a child uh, is, is, or a teenager is told, look, come to Leeds, there are not enough jobs in London, or because you don't have the right paperwork, I can get you something in London, and then you, you're moved out of London to somewhere where you're not sure of the area, you're forced into work, forced into labour, or you're forced into sexual servitude, forced into domestic housework, forced into doing care, cleaning jobs and not being paid properly or not being paid at all, that is a form of trafficking and that's happening as a result of what we're seeing. High costs of living in London, people without recourse to public funds, being forced into awkward and awful situations. So the hostile, it's not just a hostile environment, it's an unpalatable series of breaches as I see it <laughs> um, in many ways the, the the fact that they've made fees so high means that many people cannot access the right or the ability to regularize their stay 
many people can't access justice. Where does the future hold for immigrants? The problem we have now is we have a new Home Secretary. Um, Mr. Javid, as we have him, has said that he wants to put things right, but he's not able to deal with the whole um, set of problems in one go. The aim, especially within the diaspora community and Nigerian community, I know we're trying to put back a feedback to, to the government. These are our issues, or these are the issues affecting hundreds of thousands of people, if you don't know. It's not just the Windrush people. We've said sorry to them, that's nice, but sorry is not enough. It's, it's, it's important that we have a fair immigration policy. And um, you've seen petitions floating around, some petitions saying there should be an amnesty. Even Boris Johnson has suggested there should be an amnesty. But in real terms, how would an amnesty work? How should it work? What would, what would be considered fair? These are things that, as a community, as a nation, not just people who are subject to immigration control, but people who are not subject to immigration control, that we need to contribute to um, suggestions to make sure that we get it right going forward. Even employers, we have many, and I spoke to uh, an employer most recently who has an OBE, and she says she simply cannot keep on members of staff who are subject to immigration control uh, for, for too long, especially when there's delays on their case, because she as an employer puts herself at risk. So that means you're, the, the, the <laughs> a hostile environment is costing jobs. It's actually regressing the economy. And that's a serious thing that not many people seem to realize. We're not saying that all illegal migrants should be given the right to stay in the UK. No, not at all. But should we allow people who've been here for 15 years and that have been contributing, that have children, should we allow um, children who have been here for eight years, five years, who have siblings, should we allow parents to stay if their children have a right to stay, even if they're not in a family unit? all these children that are involved in certain levels of crime some of them have absent parents because they've been deported family units should not be separated in accordance with home office policy but it happens a lot so going forward it's really um important in my opinion that the community give feedback we are gathering feedback through um, an ngo called affirm human rights and we're doing that with Brit Afrique. And I know that um, another part of the community is also trying to prepare some feedback. But within the legal front as well, many of the British Nigerian lawyers have also gathered together. And we're consulting because such a large proportion of our community is adversely affected by this policy. And it's important as lawyers for us to articulate the argument in such a way, it's not even an argument, but articulate the position of Nigerian um, migrants that are here as to how they're being adversely affected and why it might be a breach of the UK's obligations towards them, not just under the Human Rights Act, but under basic international treaties, protection of the child. Mm. Why are they not protecting children? Why are they not protecting children that come in undocumented? Why is it that they are not acting in the best interests of the children in certain cases? especially when it comes to consideration of where their parents lie in relation to their family setup. It's so important. Going forward, hopefully they might review some of the provisions that they have for Commonwealth citizens. I know that many people are praying for that to happen. Maybe different visa streams may be put in place. That's something that we hope to suggest. Because when people are given that option to come into the UK legitimately, then they would take it. But if you're given an option that um, is very restricted, and then when you get here, there's no flexibility, you think, oh, well, I'm here now, I might as well grab the whole country with both hands, I'm not going nowhere. It's, it's, um, it's sad. But if people have options and there's different routes that may be provided under different visa streams due to our relationship as part of the Commonwealth, that would be wonderful. Different new work types of visas maybe for people who are under the age of 35 or people who come from a specific field of work. It, it would be very enticing and open up the door for many people to come in and work and go back to their countries of origin and contribute there. We, we do hope 
going forward that there will be much fairer policy, uh, much mm -hmm. fairer policy. Uh, are there rules that can be played by migrants Serious. or immigrants this or that. in this case? Well, we've always said on this program, contact your MPs. Your MPs are your your voice sure in Parliament. Even know who their MPs you know, are, this is one of the things that we realise um, when people are coming into the office and they have delays on their cases. When we say contact your MP, we tend to give, tell them who their MP is in the office because they're like, who? Where's the office? <laughs> and it's your right to email your MP, call your MP with your concerns, and. Um, Really and truly, if you're in a community where your church is feeding families who have got home office delay, is it fair? Are they being treated fairly? Especially when they've paid £1,533 for the privilege of the delay. Mm. It's not right. If you are um, suffering from the delay, you're losing your job, write to your MP. Your MP can write to the home office and usually within two weeks will help get an answer. You can also write directly to the Home Office to make complaints. The sad thing is there's such a lack of accountability with the Home Office. If, for example, you've been unfairly refused a visitor's visa for somebody who's been coming, like your grandmother. Um, we've had cases like this where grandmothers have just been refused, just out of the blue, where, they're, where they've been coming and going and compliant. Why? Why is all of a sudden stopping? Or you've presented all the e evidence at the Entry Clearance Office in... Um, you know, the British Embassy, where in whatever jurisdiction or country you're in, and for some reason your evidence is queried or the decision just doesn't make sense. Because of the lack of right of appeal, you then have to think about whether to judicially review the whole process. And that's a big step, it's a lot of money. You can ask for an administrative review, which is an internal review, and if that's refused, for unjustified reasons, you then have to think about, well, do I challenge this at the High Court in the UK, lodging it to say that the decision is completely unreasonable and outline your reasons. No, the Home Office has paid out a lot of money in uh, compensation and in legal costs uh, when these challenges are successfully met. But again, making sure your applications are done properly from the get-go is number one. When you're looking for a solicitor to deal with your case, you don't just look for any solicitor, you look for the right solicitor. An expert who knows what he's doing can deal with your case the right way, achieving the best results. Hobaski Solicitors has more than 100 years of specialist experience serving the local community in immigration law, property law, human rights legislation, civil and criminal litigation, family law, employment law, Sharia law, business law, maritime and commercial law, providing professional legal services globally in Africa, Asia and Europe. Be assured we'll be able to deal with your case the absolute right way with results. So contact us today by phone on 020-7739-7549 or go online at www.legalpal.com. Another thing that we have realised is that uh, when you are facing adversity or issues with the Home Office and the Home Office then seek to get maybe a travel warrant for yourself, it's important that or your case has not been treated properly, that you explain to your embassy that no, the, the UK government have not carried out their obligations towards me in a fair manner and state why. Um, these representations can be difficult to make. Um, we're not suggesting that um, you do this if you're not sure how to do it but get help there are people that want to do good and help but there are many people out there that unfortunately and unwittingly may hamper your case because it's um, a specialized area and we see from the hostile environment that you need to have somebody who's truly experienced who's making representations on your behalf mm. are these uh High Commission's living up to their responsibilities in terms of protecting the interests of their national. You see, many of them have already signed memorandums of understanding with the UK government, you know, and this is so that the UK government can affect its immigration policy robustly. So, in other words, many of them have agreed on, on, to an understanding that 
if they're nationals are subject to removal, they'll be subject to being removed with limited notice. Um, and that in itself is something that's worrying. So I've got a, a national in your country and you're saying that within five days of them being notified, they can just be removed. What about their belongings? What about their family? What about how I'm supposed to receive them in the country since they've been away from the country for so long? So all these things do need to be looked at. Many of the teams in the embassies do their best, but they do their best within the knowledge and information that they have. You know, you're not going to expect that somebody who's been working in the immigration team of, for example, the Nigerian um, embassy is going to know the full rights or appeal rights that a citizen has that's in detention that says, no, I've got family, I've not been represented well, don't issue me a travel document. That individual that works for the embassy is just going to give the citizen as much advice as they can, given the information they have. They're not going to read through the person's whole immigration file from the home office mm -hmm. they're just going to act on the information that they have so it's imperative that you have a lawyer representing your interests that can make those representations to the embassy if necessary and on to the home office you cannot expect them to make wave a magic wand they also have to maintain a relationship with the uk government mm -hmm. and if there's international agreements that have been signed memorandums that have been signed they will equally have an obligation as to how they have to operate and uh, help affect UK immigration policy whilst also trying their best to protect the interests of their citizens. Still talking about uh, the OSAD environment, uh, there, there are people who probably have exhausted all, uh, all the available legal options to them and it has always come back uh, negative on the part of the applicant. Mm. Yet they haven't got, um, say for instance, somebody who's been in the UK, that's quite a long time, 10 years in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. uh, no record of, no criminal record, but hasn't got any special reason to, or grounds to grounds remain. Grounds to remain. Exactly. No child, mm -hmm, um, no. Mm -hmm. no family connection. Not caring for anyone. Not caring for anybody. But, but doesn't just, want to go back. But just trusting on the fact that, look, he or she's been in the UK for 10 years. Yeah. And he's been trying. And they're mm -hmm. in their 30s, their 40s. They don't have any ill health. Probably, probably not even their well, 30s, the but in their 40s, you 50s. See, 10 what, years in the UK. What we have to look at is the, the UK government has a right to maintain its borders should it let everybody in, anybody in, and anybody that's been here for 10 years, should they just be given the right to stay automatically? What adverse effect would that have on the UK economy? You see, we cannot just simply say that that person, the example you've given, should have a right to stay. At the moment, there's no route, no clear category for such a person to stay. No family, no ill health, no special reason. So that no, child. no child. So that individual has to make her decision. Do I continue to live in the UK unlawfully, undocumented, or do I make steps and arrange to go back voluntarily? And it's a hard decision because if that person makes an application, they are technically throwing one thousand five hundred and thirty-three pounds away because they don't. They're not going to be granted. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, again My for pleasure. being part of the program. And so we've been talking about uh, the home offices, hostile environment, uh, spoken about a couple of years ago, and how this has been affecting people in the United, in the United Kingdom, the impact on people, the rising cost of applications at different routes, and what you do need to do yourself, the role you do need to play. But basically what is important is uh, whatever situation you are, you need to speak with people who are professionals, uh, not just any, uh, any anybody. Do not take your case to just anybody. Ensure that you're speaking with qualified solicitors who know their onions uh, in what they are doing. Uh, but if you are concerned, you may get in touch with us on the program uh, through the phone line that you see uh, uh, on the screen. We might be able to offer you some help. Alternatively, speak to Citizens Advice Bureau. My name is Tudia Labi. It's been a pleasure having you uh, join us today on this program as we again look at uh, legal matters in the United Kingdom, specifically, specifically on the hostile immigration hostile environment of the government. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah.
Democracy gives everyone the rights of expression, a passage to a world of freedom, a world that is free, that is fair, equitable, and that is just. But indeed, how just, fair, and equitable is democracy to the people? How economically free are the people in a world of globalization? Join the discussion, have your say here, live on Ben Television on Newsponge.